Hi, I'm Pastor Stephen Pribble, pastor of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And I'm Pastor Brian Schwertley of Reformation Fellowship Reformed Presbyterian Church. Welcome to Reformation Forum, the program relating the unchanging truth of Scripture to current day issues. Tonight's subject is election. And uh, we're not going to be talking about the mayoral elections in Lansing tonight. We're going to be talking about something that really is far more important, and that is a subject that is often uh, neglected and often uh, uh, Christians are very uh, anxious when they would even think about it and they don't want people to know that the Bible <coughs> teaches about that particular subject. But it's something that is vitally important, something you need to know about. So listen tonight as we speak from the Word of God about something that is uh, very important to you. Are you elect? Are you on your way to heaven? Of course, that is the vitally important question. And uh, Brian, uh, I guess we need to answer why it is important. What is election? First of all, would you just uh, answer that for us? And then why is it so important? Well, first of all, we want to talk about what is election. Now, the Bible, uh, we want to make it clear that the Bible speaks of different kinds of election. Now, the word election in the Greek uh, basically means to choose, and it refers to God's choosing of for example, nations, uh, Israel is chosen over, let's say, China. It can refer to uh, uh, someone being, uh, being chosen to be a prophet or an apostle, chosen for a task. And tonight we're focusing in on being chosen to salvation. And uh, that word was used in uh, Greek literature, the secular literature, for example, of a general choosing a captain and giving him a specific task, setting him apart for a specific task. And what we're talking about is the sovereign choice of God before the foundation of the world to choose some people to eternal life. And those are called the elect. They are the chosen ones, chosen by God according to God's sovereign will and his own purpose. Not of it because of anything in them, but solely because of God's purpose and choice. And it's a doctrine that people don't believe in anymore. It's a doctrine that people don't like. But it's very clearly taught in the Word of God, and it's a doctrine that you need to believe in because it exalts Jesus Christ. It exalts God the Father. They are sovereign in salvation, and they get all the glory. They get all the credit. Now, let me, let's look at a few passages real quick. Just get an idea how clear this is taught in the Bible. If you have a Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm going to read verse 3 to 6. Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us He's talking to believers. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him. Now, when did he choose Christians to be Christians? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to to the good pleasure of His will. Okay, God chose, not because of anything in us, not because of human merit, not because of foreseen faith, not because of any kind of God uh, looking down the quarters of time. God chose, it says, certain people to be believers, it says, because of His good pleasure. It's an excellent passage. Another passage, Acts 13, verse 48. Acts 13, 48. Very clear passage. It says here, and here's the Gentiles now. They believe in the gospel. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as, as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Now, that word appointed in the Greek, once again, we have that word. It can be translated as appoint, uh, foreordained, ordained. The word there is in the passive. And it means that these people were appointed to eternal life from an outside source. It means they did not appoint themselves to eternal life. It means that God appointed them to eternal life. Now, you wonder, you go to an evangelistic meeting, you're sitting there, uh, this person believes in Christ, this person does not, this person believes in Christ, and this person over here does not. Why is that? What makes the difference? The difference is God's choice before the foundation of the world, to choose an elect, to choose a people for himself. Now, you may not like that, but there's no way to get around what this says in the Greek language. And then, of course, a classic passage, turn to Romans chapter 9, and I'm going to read just a little bit of this, 13 to 16. 
It says here, as, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have hated. Now what Paul is doing here is he's explaining in the context, he's explaining why not all Israel is, uh, why many of the people of Israel have not believed in the gospel. Why is it that you have an elect nation with so many unbelievers? And Paul's explaining that, and he says, uh, not all the elect, or not all Israel is Israel. And he says here, Jacob I loved, Esau I have hated. He picks twins, twin brothers conceived in the same moment, born only minutes apart. They had the same mother. They had the same father. Okay. They were covenant children. They were children that were conceived because of prayer through a miraculous miracle of God. And if anything, Esau would be the favored one. He was born first. Okay. And it says, if you read Genesis, I think it's 25, it says in that chapter that his father loved him. Jacob loved him. He was favored by his father. He was born first. He had every human advantage. But it says here, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have hated. And it says that before any of them were born, God chose the one. And then it's, we say here, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteous with, God, with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whomever I'll have compassion. And this is the killer here, uh, verse 16. So then, it is not of him who wills, okay, it's not an act of the human will that makes God choose one person over another, nor is it, it is him who runs, okay, it's not anything to do with human merit, it's not something that you do to, that is the reason that God chose you as a Christian, but of God who shows mercy. And what Paul is doing here, he's answer, answering the natural response. Well, that's unfair. God chose these people. He didn't choose these people. And the point is, is that we all deserve to go to hell. God has mercy. Mercy is unmerited favor. Mercy is that God saves someone who deserves to go to hell. And it's all because of God's choice. And it just says here that God... Uh, has compassion on whoever will compassion. It's just an, a great verse. So we have to understand God, the doctrine of election, or the doctrine that God predestinates some people unto life and others he passes by, is a doctrine that glorifies God. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is an act of God from start to finish. It is not something that we do. Uh, theologians refer to this as monergism. Okay? It is something that God does. It's not God and but something that God does. That's why the Bible teaches that faith in Christ is a gift and repentance are gifts, gifts from God. Uh, you know, most Christians believe that election is based on foreseen faith. And uh, I know you're going to talk about Romans 8, or foreknowledge. And uh, basically the idea, God looks down the corridors of time and he sees who exercises faith and then God chooses them. And what's wrong with this view? Well, Brian, uh, before I, I speak about what's wrong with the view, let me just say that I think the reason that this is such a popular view is because it removes the stigma, so to speak, uh, in the minds of unregenerate people. It removes the stigma from God, and uh, people are afraid that if the doctrine of election is preached that the wicked will, uh, will, will resent God, and he won't be so popular among the wicked because uh, they, they will think that... Uh, uh, here's uh, a situation where man doesn't have a free choice and where man can do nothing and, and man is just passive and he's just a puppet and, uh, and so forth. And so to remove the stigma from, uh, from God uh, and to, to change, to shift the responsibility for who goes to hell and who goes to heaven from God to man, this uh, doctrine of foreseen faith uh, was brought up. Now. The, the word foreknowledge is used in the Bible, but it's not used in the way that people that teach foreseen faith would like to think that it's used. It says in Romans 8.29, for whom he did foreknow, and there's that word, foreknowledge, whom he did foreknow, the verb form, for, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And what happens here is that people who uh, want to evade the, the uh, clear teaching of the Bible concerning God's awesome sovereignty and salvation, they will jump on this verse and they'll say, aha, see, there's foreknowledge and then there's predestination. Predestination follows foreknowledge. And it's very simple, they think. What God did, he looked down the corridors of, of time 
the corridors of human history, and only God can see the future, only God knows the future. Uh, the local clairvoyant or uh, fortune teller does not know the future. They don't bat a thousand. They don't have a, a record of 100% accuracy. They should be executed uh, if biblical law were being followed. But anyway, only God knows the future. And so these, these opponents of the view that we are giving tonight will say, uh, see, God saw uh, what was going to happen in the future, and then God foreordained things. And so it's all very simple, or so they think. The only problem is the passage does not say for what he did foreknow. That is the sinner's choice. It does not say for what he did foreknow. It's not neuter. It's masculine. And this is the generic masculine, uh, masculine inclusive uh, form, meaning uh, men and women uh, among the elect, those that are going to come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, for whom he did foreknow. Them he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. There are lots of individuals who are going to be saved. There are many. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. And so here we have the unbroken chain reaching way back to eternity past with God's foreknowledge of individuals not foreknowledge of actions. He foreknew individuals. And it's in the sense here of an intimate relationship. Adam knew his wife, and she bare a son. They called his name Cain. God knows individuals intimately. He knows us from even before uh, one of our members came to be. Psalm 139 uh, makes that clear. And he knew us, those of us who, uh, who have been predestinated, who have been called, who have been chosen, who have been uh, uh, justified, who have been glorified. He knew us. So uh, what's wrong with this view? Well, everything is wrong with this view. The Bible does not teach that God elects on the basis of uh, actions that he's going to see. In other words, God is not uh, reflexive. God, uh, God works in our salvation. He is the sole worker, and that's why uh, Brian used the term monergism just a little while ago. So uh, what's wrong with this view? <coughs> well, obviously the Bible does not teach uh, this view. Uh, the sole agent of election is God. Uh, Brian, let's consider uh, how this might relate to another very important doctrine. Uh, we speak uh, in Reformed circles of the doctrine of total depravity, by which we mean that man uh, is incapable of even taking that first baby step to God, but I know you'll explain that. But uh, how is election the logical corollary of total depravity, which is man's state after the fall? Oh, it, it naturally flows from it. You have to understand uh, that all Orthodox evangelicals, all Christians believe that uh, in Adam, the human race fell. You know, the only one that did, was not tainted with that sin, of course, was Jesus Christ in his human nature, who was born of a virgin. But, you know, in Adam, man died spiritually, and man is dead spiritually. Man's not sick. Man's not just impaired. He's dead spiritually. And that's why we read in 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says here, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Because of man being a fallen creature, a creature that is dead in trespasses and sins, he cannot, of his own volition, choose Christ. Okay, uh, and this brings us, we've had another show on the new birth, but it says very specifically in uh, John's Gospel, John chapter 3, that the new birth is something that God does. It's an act upon the human soul, which is a spiritual raising his soul from the dead, enabling him to see and understand spiritual truth. So uh, when he hears the Gospel, he goes, wow, that's fantastic, I believe it. But when, before that regenerating act of the Holy Spirit, before the new birth, you cannot see spiritual truth. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. It's very crystal clear. I mean, here in Ephesians it says, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 1 through 3, And you he made alive, who were, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Not